Welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. We are live today with Miss Sandy, and she is going to share her story of how she became a homeschool mom, um, her own childhood experiences that led her to make that decision. Um, a little bit of a trigger warning for some folks. The Not all the parts of the story are happy parts, but it has a happy ending. So hopefully you can watch with us. And if you can't, we totally understand. Um, if you are seeing our faces, then you are either on Facebook or YouTube. And if you are not, then you are on our audio on a podcast. So if you want to find us in the opposite version, head to one of those places. Um, podcast is called Sure Parenting. YouTube channel is called Sure Parenting. Facebook page is called Sure Parenting. So <laughs> we're easy enough to find, uh, but we're really glad to have you here. And I'm so excited and so honored that you chose to join us today, Sandy. Could you introduce yourself to the audience? Hi, hello. Um, my name is Sandy. Uh, now I'm, I'm Sandy Varela, but um, I am now Sandy Van Epps. I am a mother of four. I grew up in Mexico and I came as an adult uh, to live in the United States with my family that was already living here. Um, I, I love school. Uh, I just didn't love going to school when I was a kid. And um, I am a homeschooling mom, so we homeschool all our children. I love it. What are your age range for your kids? Um, my youngest is three. Then I have a five-year-old, so kindergarten. Um, my neurodivergent child is in second grade. Uh, he's eight. And then I have a nine going on 10 and awesome. going on teens. Oh, for sure. Five year old. Oh, yes. The tweens are real. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So when you were, uh, before you came here, did you know that you wanted to homeschool or was that not really a consideration yet? Um, when I came to the United States, actually, I was not in the having children mode. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk to my family, I really never wanted to have children. I was going to be um, single forever and and childless, maybe dogs, lots of dogs. <laughs> uh, but then I I came out here and after a few years of being here, actually, I met my now husband um, and the love of my life and we have four children. <laughs> so everybody <laughs> thought that was, that was shocking. Yeah. So we started late in life too. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I know you have lots of stories and we're gonna definitely have you back to share some more <laughs> because you have incredible wisdom to share and you've been on some wild rides. Um, but for today, I wanted you to share your experiences that made you think, you know, there's got to be a different way. I want something different for my kids. Um, it's, it's hard. So, so when I was I mean, first of all, uh, the the state of the schools in Nevada and um, where we live are not as we don't have the best school system. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always thought that education is very important. And I didn't feel like school gave me what I needed okay. for for living in the world. Um, so I I didn't I did want to do better for my children. And, uh, you know, you hear about all these things happening in schools nowadays and they have to increase the security and all the scares. And um, I didn't really want to live with that stress. Um, so I wanted in a way to protect my children from mm -hmm. all of those realities. Yeah, of course. I think that's a consideration, at least for a lot of us that homeschool. Um, and, and even if it isn't necessarily one of the driving factors, it's still like a perk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, um, you know, we homeschool because of the neurodiversity in our family. Um, public school is not a very good fit, no. but, uh, there's definitely perks that, you know, my friends and family, um, things they have to worry about and things they have to consider that I'm grateful that I don't have to. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, if we go through your schooling experience, 
um, so that what you said, it does, it didn't feel like it prepared you for real world or for, for being an adult. Um, what are some of the things that you're doing now to ensure that that's different for your kids? Well, I feel well, like in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for once, uh, we're trying to make learning fun. Uh, we try to, we don't, say we're just doing school i mean school learning happens every day at all times with everything that we do so we try to be really involved in the community um we try to be like at all these cultural events um fairs book fairs uh, we try to like catch it all uh there's so many resources for that um we also I feel like learning about our environment is also crucial because of the way society is going and a lot of people don't care and we should start caring. So we do a lot of uh, camping and out, a lot of outdoor life, you know. Um, we work on our skills, even, even at home, you know, helping around the house, uh, being part of a family. And we all have, we don't have chores. We all help. We all mm -hmm. help around the house. I think that's the way to do it. Uh, they learn to do laundry. They learn to do all these little skills. Um, and I mean, we do our normal like school load, you know, language and math because it's important. But I feel like most of the learning is taken during our daily life, like our daily living, li sorry, daily living. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually we do chores that way too. It's like, this is our home. We all live here. We all contribute to making it feel good and look good. And, you know, I have no uh, goal of looking like a magazine, you know, aesthetic. That's not my thing. It can look like we live here, but also everybody from the youngest to the oldest can contribute. And I think that there's sometimes a little bit of a miss um, an unintended consequence if it's like, okay, well, here's your money for your chores. Then there's this idea of like, oh, well, we only do chores to get money. And we exactly. would rather, we are all living here and part of living anywhere is taking good care of your space. Mm -hmm. And so we just do that. And then if there's, you know, extra jobs that I might hire out, they are welcome to do that for money. Um, but that's kind of how we do it. We are looking unrelated to this particular topic, but I just read um, The Opposite of Spoiled and he makes quite a case for some version of allowance. So we're toying with this idea a little bit of having almost like a curriculum, like let's take some money and let's manipulate it. You know, what part of it should be towards giving? Who, who would you want to donate it to? You know, what organizations do work that you feel good about that you want to be involved in? Like maybe more focused on that um and not just like oh yeah. here's six dollars let's go buy more pokemon cards you know <laughs> um because that's an important part of, of little kids playing with money and, and experiencing money but uh when you are homeschooling like you said everything can become part of learning and there's so much opportunity to explore ideas and really live the learning that you're having so I, that's my favorite part of it. <laughs> um, I agree. Um, and I know that, you know, part of your protecting your kids um, included some experience for you with bullying. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so my, my school went well all the way through elementary. I, it was a blast. Elementary school was amazing. I was like, um, I believe I grew up with ADHD and nobody knew it. Mm -hmm. so it was Same. undiagnosed. Like I have it diagnosed now as an adult. Same. And so I was a very dreamy, like in reality child. Like everything was just like in my mind and mm -hmm. uh, magical. And I loved it. My, my elementary school was like the best with my best friend. And we did all kinds of th things. But then, um, because I was also so very smart, I um, I was I was admitted at a very fancy um, bilingual private school. Okay. And it was a great opportunity if you look at it as a parental kind of way, because right. you know it's better education, better everything. Mm -hmm. And I had a hundred percent scholarship to go there. 
Like we didn't really grow up as a, we were like middle, low-ish class uh -huh. growing up in Mexico. Yeah. Um, so you would think that that showed in the way I dressed and the way I presented myself in a fancy school like that. All these kids had like drivers and babysitters and I didn't, mm -hmm. you know? So, and I was geeky. So that, that just was the best recipe for me to be bullied every mm -hmm. single day. Mm -hmm. It was, it was so bad. Um, I would cry myself to sleep. I, I cried in the mornings cause I didn't want to go to school. Um, mm -hmm. it was really, really sad. I would get, um, basketballs thrown in my head if I was oh walking God. somewhere near the, the, the schoolyard. Um, mm -hmm. I remember one time, uh, football was slammed onto my lunch plate. So I didn't have anything to eat that day. Mm -hmm. Um, people would push me towards the wall. Like I had, I had, I cracked my head so many times on the wall because people just push me to the mm -hmm. side to walk through me. Yeah. Um, where were the adults? Huh? Where were the adults? Exactly, right? So 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 the teachers there were very dismissive uh, because people have money and could pay their way. Um, um that I think that was the problem. Um I remember I, I mean there were so many traumatic instances that I can that I can tell you. Um I, I did have three other friends that were in the same boat as me. And uh one of them didn't make it through adulthood. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, she and it was because of the bullying that she got through in oh school that she just couldn't get over it. My other friend is still dealing with anxiety and like a lot of issues. And and, and the other friend I lost contact with. I I wish I could I know where she is, mm -hmm. but I get it. She just got communication completely. It was that bad. How people deal. They're just like, I'm going to not have that be a part of my story anymore. I'm just going to move forward and not look back at all, even to the kind people. Exactly. And and the thing is, I'm a Gen X. So that means that I was, I mean, my parents were great parents to, they did what they could, like yeah. you said, with the information that they had back then. Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't really like supportive in the bullying part. Like they would tell me, I mean, they were in their way. I'm not right. They were in their way. They, in their they, way. The they had. Well, the things, the way they supported me was not helpful for me. Okay. Can you um, tell me what would have been helpful for parents whose kids maybe are going through something like this now? I think hear me out in a change of schools because the problems weren't resolved or maybe like being more, um, more advocates at my school, like making sure the bullying stopped. Like mm -hmm. we had name. I, I knew exactly like all the kids that were bullies and uh, just nothing, no matter how much I complained or I said, or I voiced it out, it just nothing ever got done about the bullying. Right. Which starts to make you feel like helpless. Yes. Yes. In a way. I mean, I, uh, again, your trigger warnings, but I did think about unaliving myself at some point. Yeah. Because it was, I just couldn't deal with it and I didn't know what else to do. How long were you at that school? Three years. Okay. So that was like middle school age. So in Mexico, we do elementary. So first to sixth grade. And then okay. you go into something called secundaria, which uh -huh. would be kind of like your junior high equivalent. Uh -huh. So that would be seven, eight, and ninth. Okay. And then you go into high school, which is the, the last three years. Okay. So it's a little different, but kind it's of. A little, yeah. So it's six, three, three. Okay. I, I think here is like six to four, right? It's and five. Three. Well, it's six if you count kindergarten, but it ends at fifth grade. And then it goes six, seventh, eighth in middle school um, and then nine through 12 in high school. In, kindergarten is separate for us. Nice. So that's like three years of kindergarten. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, we start early. Yeah, and I think here we would call that preschool. Yeah, preschool, exactly. So, so after those three years, you left this, you know, what was supposed to be a special school and ended up really n maybe being special academically, but definitely not emotionally. No. Um, and then you went to high school? So I went, 
my parents wanted me see again the support my parents wanted me to stay in that school and mm -hmm. push through because it was a great school it would give me great opportunities and i still have my my scholarship okay um but i i really started advocating for me that's one of the things that is really good about me is that i i've been a very vocal person and i've always been kind of like not the black sheep of the family but like if I don't agree, I will make it. Which can be very black sheepish. I know yeah. it, culturally women are raised to be more submissive, like more, you know, do what your parents say, do what your husband says. Like there's a cultural mm -hmm. expectation uh, of what a woman should act like. And so to be that young and to be like, yeah, this doesn't work for me. That's yeah. awesome. Um, and I it's to advocate for myself. That's amazing. Um, and so I told my parents that I wanted to go to this um, government funded school and because mm -hmm. my best friend had told me she was going to go there. And um, I said, I want to go there. And my parents are like, well, if you want to go there, then you have to do the research, go figure out how what you need to go in there. And do so I, I did all that. I And there was no internet. Mind you, I had to go to the school, find out what paperwork I needed to fill. I filled out all my paperwork. I uh, I did my um, my test, like you have mm -hmm. to do a test to get in. Mm -hmm. So I did the testing. I did everything. And the public transportation are 15 because they wouldn't even drive me there. Yeah. Because um, they wanted me to keep going to the private school. Right. They're like, I'm um, not participating yeah. in this. If you are going to have enough grit to get there, mm -hmm. then I guess you'll figure it out. Yeah. But this isn't, and I can, I can have compassion for that. You know, if mm -hmm. you have something that's out of reach financially, and then you have it gifted to you, it feels on some level like, well, we should just do this. Like, yes. when are we ever going to have this chance again? And so it can be a really hard choice to sit and observe it factually and go, okay, while it's great that it was free and we got the scholarship and this shows her merit, this isn't a safe environment either. No. And because of the culture of the school, if you have money, you can do no wrong. So there's not even a way to make it a safe environment. Um, and I, I, that's a, it's a hard call. I, I know that parents have really struggled with, you know, but this is the best school and this is the greatest education. Here's something that they teach you when you become a teacher, because I was a teacher um, before I did this. They teach you that a brain that doesn't feel safe has a really hard time absorbing knowledge. Mm -hmm. So part of, of teaching is actually creating a safe classroom for your students. And for somebody as brilliant as you to be able to get a full ride scholarship, your capacity to learn was knocked way down no. by not feeling safe. No, I, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. I, uh, my parents said that I was when they, when I was little, cause I was, I was, I was actually kicked out of kindergarten cause I was too smart for kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I taught myself to read when I was, when I was three. Mm. Um, and I remember how I taught myself to read. How? Uh, through advertisement. So again, oh I'm a latchkey kid. Uh, I watch a lot of TV. Uh -huh. And so I I would start watching, you know, advertisements and they have always like slogans. Yeah. Like siempre Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. And then so I would look at those words and start relating the sounds of the the, how they were saying it they were saying, yeah and so i started recognizing the same words around the city in other advertisements and started and recognizing recognizing them. words and reading words and so when i was three i i could read already that's amazing so i started reading books i mean i read the iliad and the odyssey when i was like in second grade by oh my gosh because i just and that's the other thing i didn't feel like school gave me the knowledge I needed. That's what I said. You Our gave me the knowledge you needed. I read all the books. Mm -hmm. I read encyclopedias. I read the Encyclopedia Britannica just because I needed to read something because I needed to learn more. Would you um, consider yourself hyperlexic? 
uh, what is hyperlexic? Yeah. So hyperlexic is a type of neurodiversity or kind of a, a piece of neurodiversity. Uh, I think I usually see it associated with autism, but it's like words and reading and absorbing knowledge in that way is like off the charts. Like that's, it just, mm -hmm. your brain just soaks it up. Like that's your favorite thing. It probably, probably. Um, I read to learn mm -hmm. uh, because I crave that. Mm -hmm. And so reading was the thing I, my, my, when I was a kid, I remember looking at the library and thinking, oh my God, can I ever read all these books? Like right. I didn't want to sit here and read all the books. Yeah. So maybe, yes, um, I had to, I never had to study for my tests. Yeah. But to be able to pass my test, I always just had to write down or copy things. Mm -hmm. And just doing that would make it kind of like it would stick. My, mm -hmm. yeah, stick in there. Um, so Absolutely. I would always ace everything. You and I have a lot of similarities. I don't think I read it three. I actually don't know when I started reading. But I've always want, read to learn. And mm. I keep track. I actually have over here. I, a couple years ago, decided to start writing down, like, all the books that I read. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I read a lot. And yeah. I love that. And I think that it's one of the things with homeschooling that is so special is that my goal isn't necessarily any one particular curriculum. Mm -hmm. It is, do you love learning? Do you know how to find resources to learn things? And, and do you know how to work with the brain you have? I mean, fortunately, for folks that like to read, there's always a book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with ADHD, I really like audiobooks because then I can do stuff while mm -hmm. I'm reading. Um, yeah. But even for kids whose brains work differently, is there a video? Is there a local mentor? I think it's brilliant that you're out in your community and your children feel like they're part of something bigger. And there's this idea that you can learn anything. It's just finding the path to that knowledge. Um, and so, un again, unintentional consequences, some people experience in public school this like okay well i'm just supposed to sit here and wait for this one person of authority to tell me what to think and then they i oof, the numbers i see different numbers all the time but i've seen as high as like 75 percent of adults never read a book after high school wow yeah which is, that is very high. strange to my brain because i'm like i'm on book 49 for the year yeah like i love reading and um you know, my oldest is like that. He loves reading. He reads all the time. He reads a lot of books. My middle likes to read, but he has a very hard time. He, I suspect dyslexia for him. Mm -hmm. And because we read so much, because we read aloud, because we play audiobooks, because we discuss literature, because we make connections, he still loves reading. Even though it's yeah. hard, his idea of reading is still this really positive thing. He's not thinking, oh, I'm done. I can't do this. He's thinking, uh, okay, I have to work a little harder. I have to practice more. I have to find a book at my level and then work through it and then mm -hmm. level up to the next level. Like he just has this idea and this attitude about reading that I think that that mental space is so much more valuable than just checking off the boxes and being like, okay, well, I, you know, he had to read this book. He loves reading and he keeps seeking out reading, even though it's hard. That's awesome to me. Yes. That mindset is awesome to me. Uh, Andy says, amazing mom and teacher. You are the best, Sandy. Oh, <laughs> I think that's my cousin. <laughs> that's so sweet. Um, so have you experienced with your children in homeschooling, um, any challenges to engaging with other kids? So, yes, uh, I was actually going to tell you there's um, so my kids get along really well with all children. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, to me, just because of what I lived bullying, it's a big like a really big trigger. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very challenging for me, especially my five year old. 
he is rambunctious, he is in your face, he is got like a thousand energy rate at all times, mm -hmm. and some kids can't handle him. Yeah. Uh, and I get it. I, I, you know, I talk to him all the time about like lowering the energy level, like keeping his hands to you, to himself, um, not being in people's faces, but that's what he does. Well, and have you, I, I am not a doctor. I don't diagnose anyone. Yeah. What I know is that when mom has ADHD, sometimes the kid will have ADHD. Yes. <laughs> um, and if a child is is um, experiencing an ADHD brain, their executive functioning specifically will be a couple years behind, about 30% behind. Mm -hmm. And so that can be real tricky because you've got a five-year-old body, but the self-control of more of like a three-year-old. Yeah. And it's hard for people to understand that. And then with ADHD and other neurodiversities, there's deep sensory needs. Mm -hmm. And so if they, my middle has like a proprioceptive need, he wants to push and like be touching people and leaning against people. And it feels like he wants to crawl into your skin. And he's now nine, he just turned nine and he has a much better control of like who he does that with. But his brother, all always fair game. Me, always fair game. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, and it's like, He's, his body has this need that maybe is a little different than other kids. And it can be tricky to help them figure out how can I meet that need, but still respect the comfort level of this other person that I'm with. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something that he deals with? I, I've i thought about, about it. It's just, I mean, I didn't think, or, or no, I it's been on my mind that he might be ADHD. Oh, he might have ADHD. I, it's just like so hard because he's so different to the other brother, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it's kind of like when you're a mom, you kind of forget how they wear at that age. Oh yeah. And then, and then I thought maybe because it was COVID hit and we weren't seeing people and that was when he was about three. So he didn't learn to be social with other people. Yeah. And maybe that affected him. Definitely possible. Um, it affected many, many, many children. <laughs> uh, so anyways, we struggled a lot with that. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know he needs a lot of rough housing. He loves seeing mm -hmm. my brother because they like rough house all over the place. And Does he seem he way that. stronger than he should be? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes the other part that goes with proprioceptive can be um, interoceptive, where like the feelings inside of your body, you're not always super aware of, like putting mm. them into words can be really tricky, um, which is why sometimes they just act because they don't know how to explain like, oh, I really want a rough house with you. Like putting it into words takes a whole bunch yeah. of different energy. So it's like, I'll just dive bomb on top of you. Yes. That's, that's um, what does. Yeah. Yeah. And they can totally learn these skills. It's just their brain doesn't necessarily, um, that's like a harder path. The easier mm -hmm. path is to just show you with my body what I'm thinking of or, or wanting. Um, have you found any neurodiverse like groups or meetups where him playing that way would be met with another kid who wants to play that way? So I've, I mean, uh, we, we, we have our homeschool families, you mm -hmm. know, and, and there is children that can handle him, especially older children. Okay. So yeah. It, yeah, it's yeah. Good when he's around kids that are like, maybe like 11, 12, cause they can handle him and they just push him off to the side and he's, he's fine being shoved to the side and then he goes back at it. And mm -hmm. um, it probably actually feels soothing to his body yes. to get that pressure. And that's how he plays with his with his cousins who mm -hmm. are like 13 and 17 and he loves them and they love him and mm -hmm. he so i i do notice that he does so much better with children that are that are bigger than him that are stronger than him probably. stronger than him yeah. yeah i can definitely see that making sense we have a co-op that we go to and there's a boy who's probably 16 and he's so good with the rowdy little boys mm -hmm. like he he'll just go all out with these little kids yeah. and it's 
wonderful because I don't love that kind of play. <laughs> I, don't, I don't either. But but to see them like actually the because the older kid measures their strength, so they're not mm -hmm. just gonna like right because they're older they're not taking mm -hmm. it personally they're no. using as much strength as they need but they're still stronger so they're not going yeah. to be hurt by this five-year-old no. but they can they can um modulate how much pressure to use with him and i think that's that's the beauty of living in community and not just mm -hmm. in a box with other five-year-olds like yeah it's he has these needs that really are better met by these older children awesome you can be around older children too. Um, and the more that he develops, the more he will be, be able, able to. to control turning that on and off. Not necessarily yeah. that the need will go away. He may end up in jujitsu because he just really wants to fling his body around and slam other people into the mat. Like if that's always his sensory profile, fantastic. There's totally ways to do that. But being able to choose when it's appropriate and when it's better to use self-control, that grows with age and practice. So, um, like, how awesome is it that he has the opportunity to practice those things in the real world now? Yeah. And this is your child who um, who I, I think this is uh, your child who, when he was really little, had a, had a thing happen, right? Yes, uh, when he was four weeks old, he had a brain bleed. Okay. And then, um, and we were in the hospital for like a month and it was pretty stressful. Um, yeah. but we made it through. Yeah. And then now he has uh, hydrocephalus. And okay, so like brain. that's extra fluid around his brain. Yes, because, okay. uh, and it's it's from the brain bleed and um, his Does he have body a shunt cannot. Now? Yeah, he has a shunt. Okay. So, so again, of course, is my 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 wild kid is the one that she's right? been wilding around. Oh my gosh! Well, and it makes me wonder because ADHD affects how the prefrontal cortex develops. Mm -hmm. But like, is this actually ADHD or does it look like ADHD because of you know maybe Something. pressure on yeah. his prefrontal mm -hmm. cortex? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um. But regardless, what I what I like about homeschooling, I like a lot of things about homeschooling. Clearly. One of the things I like about it is that if, whether it's ADHD or not, you don't necessarily have to know from some psychiatrist unless you want to, mm -hmm. you can still utilize tools and strategies that ADHD kids use. And if they help your kid, yay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you get to just strategize for your unique child, whatever that uniqueness might be called by somebody else. Yes. I, I love that. I love that part. I love I mean, there's so much that I love about homeschooling. I'm a, I'm a big advocate for homeschooling. I know it's not for everybody, mm -hmm. um, but it's just an amazing word, world. Um, the community, the homeschool community is so supportive. It's yeah. so different than, than people that go to school that are so like into their jobs. And like these families are like families, you know, wholesome yeah. families that, that interact with each other. The parents spend the time with the children. Not that other parents don't. I, I it's harder. It, yeah. it is harder for family time when your kid gets home and they have to do two hours of homeschool. Um, homework, yeah. Homework, and uh, and then you finally get to be around for like an hour before bedtime. It's yeah. hard. It is hard. So for us, that's been like the greatest thing in the world that. Uh, me and my husband get to spend time with our children all the time. We get to go camping whenever. We can go during the weekdays. Um, we can go on the weekends. It doesn't matter. Well, and, and that's something, too, just to keep focusing on your third child here, being able to go out into nature where you can be as loud as you want, you can climb as high as you want, mm -hmm. you can throw rocks at the trees. Like, there's so much that you can just with your energy yeah. and it doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah. And it's so hard to take that much energy and put it in a desk and say, sit still for six hours. Yeah. I don't you know. Think, yeah. And, and I think that, I mean, I, like I said, we homeschool because of neurodiversity, like there's whew, um, no, <laughs> <laughs> my, my middle could not, he still mm. literally doesn't make it through a meal sitting still. Wow. But yeah. It's hard that's not him. And because he's at home, he can, 
you know, do a little bit of math and then hang upside down and then mm-hmm. come do a little bit more math. And it's, he can work with the brain and body he has and still meet the goals that we have. And I think that that really is, is an incredible opportunity. Um, and you're right. It's not for everybody. It's not even for every kid. Um, there are kids that are really well suited for classroom learning that feel really good about that. They love their teachers. They love their peers. This isn't about like shaming other people into homeschool. No. It no. is about the parent who is like, oh my God, school is not working. Is it possible to do something different? And the answer is yes, it at is. least in Nevada yeah. and Idaho. Yeah. Um, I know there's actually some countries that have outlawed homeschooling, which makes me very sad. Um, but in America, it is legal in every state. There's just different requirements um, and different levels of difficulty. Both of us live in really homeschool friendly places. So that's mm-hmm. convenient. Um, but I think that it's important too to acknowledge that there's going to be challenges. Would you say, would you agree with that? I do. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's not all roses and rainbows around here every day. Of course sure. not. Um, just like parenting, you know, you love mm-hmm. your children. There's like so many good days, but there's some bad days too. Um, and we have that in homeschooling. Um, I mean, we just like school kids, some days the kids just don't want to do school and then you're faced with uh okay let's let's do some let's read a book uh you know <laughs> i know exactly that flop <sighs> can we do it later um there's a pushback there's a, i don't want to do it right now there's mm-hmm. a and 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 it's discouraging because you as a homeschool mom teacher you like have in your mind work out all these like fun activities that you're gonna do with the kids. We're gonna do a fun experiment. We're gonna do all this. You have, you you wake up and you're like, we're gonna get this done. And then you face with this. Uh, uh. And then you're like, oh well. Where did it come from? <laughs> where goes my energy? I don't know. I don't wanna do anything either. Yeah. Well, and I think you know, it's so important to not put our worth in somebody else's behavior. And we all do this usually, I mean, I can't say all, I don't know all people, every parent that I've met at some point has fallen into this little trap where it's like, I'm a good parent. If I'm a good homeschooler, if, and it's like, no, I'm responsible for my behavior. So that's the only thing I can be judged on. My child might be having a hard day. My child gets to practice. Like some of the best things about this is my kids get to practice. How do you do hard things when you really don't feel like it? Yeah. What little like tools can you use to help yourself overcome? One of our favorites, we have these um, Dr. John's xylitol candies and they're dye free, which is important because my kids do not do well with dyes. Um, and they're made with xylitol, which is good for your teeth. Mm-hmm. So this is why I like these candies. But more than that, sucking stimulates your vagus nerve. So you get to have a sensation of calm just a little bit. And that's a strategy we'll use. It's like, yeah, it sucks. You don't want to do this and we still have to do it today. So what strategy do you want to use? And mm-hmm. that's one of them that they'll use. It's like, oh, I'll suck on a hard candy while I do the math. And then it's this pairing of, I know my brain's having a hard time. I can use something to help myself to do this. And it could be going outside and doing it. It could be yeah. um, doing it in a different place that's more comfortable. It could be actually doing it in a place that's less comfortable. For my kiddo that like is all over the place, if we sit on the couch, he's just like flopping everywhere. But if we sit at the table, there's like structure around him mm-hmm. to help him sit and focus a little more. And I'm totally the opposite. I don't like to be uncomfortable ever at all. So I will sit on my little recliner chair with my laptop on my lap because it's cozy. My husband can't stand that. He has to sit at his desk if he's going to type anything. And I'm just like, I I can't do that. I need to be comfy. comfy. Even my chair is like squishy and comfy. And I'm sitting (laughs) across the bus. Like, it's just, we're different people. We have different brains. We Mm -hmm. have different needs. And there's still stuff we need to do. So what tools do we need to use so that we can still do them? Um, And included in that is lots of flexibility. My oldest has um, PDA. And so there's a lot of choice that goes into keeping his nervous system from being like way overrun. And so it's like, okay, yes, math is important. How are we going to touch math? 
It could be Khan Academy. It could be, a, you know, a math book. It could be a living book that talks about math concepts. There's this really cute series called Sir Conference. And it's like medieval. Oh, like, yeah. So I've, seen, I've seen them. Yeah. yeah. Um, it could be, um, you know, just doing some some sort of math that's relevant to life. Like we, he wanted to do this sale. And so we had to build this table and the, there's math involved in building. Mm -hmm. um, it could be going and baking something and using fractions. Like we just need to touch these subjects and be cognizant that we are. Uh, and that's how we do it. Not everybody does it that way. Some people are more hands-off. Some people are more strict. Um, everybody is different, but that's what I find works really well for my kids to acknowledge, because here's the thing I've tried to do like completely hands off. And he, he just goes, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. <laughs> so he needs to know, well, no, you are actually doing math right now. Yeah. You are actually, you know, increasing your reading ability. Um, you're playing Mad Libs and you're learning grammar concepts. Like there's, oh, and games, games are another huge thing. There's so many cool yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that flexibility is because we homeschool. It's not one person decides you must do this thing and that's the only way to learn this concept. Um, and I found it's actually made me more flexible with my own learning. I follow a couple of different, I never liked math. I was never bad at math, but I never liked math. And I follow a couple of different math teachers and professors online that like show unique ways to do problems and now it's very interesting it is interesting yeah. <laughs> I, love math. I always love math yeah i i don't know i think i had some teachers that did not make it fun yeah um, i had a teacher that like made fun of me and i didn't like that i was a very oh. sensitive child um and i don't think he, I really don't think he meant to. Uh, he did a couple of questionable things though. So maybe he did. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I think it just kind of made me feel like, ugh, math. Like that was just kind of my attitude. And uh, I don't know. I always did fine. I just, writing and reading, oh, I love it. I could do it every day just for fun. I mean, I do pretty much. Yeah. And <laughs> um. So I'm starting to find joy again in learning all the different ways that people do math. Whereas I thought like, oh, this is the way that you teach math. And it's like, could be, there's yeah. also these other ways. And that's really cool for me. Um, do you think that your kids see you learning a lot? Um, what do you mean? Like, like me learning as a person. Your, yeah. So whether it's because you're studying homeschooling or because you're studying math or because you're studying gardening, I, like, I mean, I think so. Cause I, I mean, I did, I did school a few years ago to, to get my uh, certification as a Spanish instructor. Right. Um, I love school. I, I love learning. Yeah. So I did, I did do that. Um, I, I study a lot about different things. Perfect. Uh, I I don't think I was in fashion school. I had my youngest when I finished when I was finishing fashion school. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I do I do study a lot. I mean, I, they see me reading. Um, they see my husband reading. He he's a, a big whiz in um, astrophysics. Oh, he, I know he loves to read uh, books. And That's astrophysics amazing. and the space and time. I love and that. I love physics, but physics was never my forte. Yeah. So it's just so amazing to hear him talking about all these theories and all these things that he knows and it's yeah. food for my brain. I love it. Right. And yeah. then your kids get the benefit of two different parents with different specialties. My husband loves history. Um, mm -hmm. and he will study history uh, and take different classes from different universities. And it's so cool to watch him and my oldest in particular, like discuss, you know, ancient Roman battles. And I'm like, I couldn't do this for you. Like, <laughs> this is not a thing that I've ever cared to know. I know enough. Yes. But like all of the details and the nitty gritty, like it's amazing to me what he knows. And it's so cool to watch them share that passion with each other and to hear my 
you know, 10 year old talk about these topics with like a familiarity that I don't think most 10 year olds have. Uh Um, And so that like idea that we're both, I'm the main primary homeschooler, but like their dad has such a value for knowledge and loves to learn and loves to study. And he shares that passion with them too. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, that's that's great. (laughs) I love it so much. So what would you do? I'm going to put you on the spot because I didn't tell you I was going to ask this If one of your kids at some point was like, I'm sick of homeschooling, I want to go to public school. I will talk about it. I, I'm open to that. I'm not going to force them to be homeschoolers for life. Um, I feel like when they're in their teens, if they, if they really want to try it out in school, we can find a compromise. We can find a school um, somewhere where I feel like they're going to be safe yeah. and that they, they of course like, um, mm-hmm. yes, I'm open. I'm open to that. I, I don't feel they need to do that until they're like, they're sure of themselves. Like I want to, I want to, I want them to be, to know themselves before yeah. they go into school, because once you go to school and they tell you, Oh, you shouldn't like this because you're mm-hmm. like in fourth grade or you shouldn't go to the playground because you know only little kids go to so you start changes changing your persona like who you are what you you like because you are you decide what other people people will like Mm -hmm. and that's very different that's that's very wise i agree i very much agree i think that there's this gradual progression to the kids taking over their own education that doesn't happen at eight. No, no. (laughs) Their interests are their interests, but there's still a lot of wisdom that they need from us and a lot of guidance. And then as they get into those later years, like they might have a really valid reason. I went to the coolest high school and I got to study law. Like I, I think something like that, if there's like a real like passion and they have the opportunity, they got, I want to say it was like 24 law credits for college because that's how that program worked. You got to leave with all of these college credits for, for law, like what an incredible opportunity to have a passion and have an interest and get to pursue it. And I think that's like a great use of the teen years. (laughs) Um, It is. is. I mean, I, I, I know the benefits from school and, um, and there's, there's options too. Like if they, they want to do like college credits and I, like there's so many options. So we'll mm-hmm. talk about that when, when it comes to the time. Um, and there probably will be even more in 10 years, you know, yes, or, seven years um, or whatever. I am open because, and again, and it goes back to how I was raised, you know, mm-hmm. like nobody, they didn't hear my plea to change schools and mm-hmm. I had to do it myself. And I don't want my children to feel like that. Yeah. And so I like think we need really, really if they really if the reason is really a good one to like switch, go back to school or go to school. Yeah. Go back. <laughs> uh then yes, I, I am here to listen to that and mm-hmm. I will support that because And I think I, it's yeah. the other way too. I think there's some kids I remember in high school there was a boy, so I went to a magnet school, so like a specialty school that you have mm-hmm. to apply to and stuff. And then all of my friends that I had previously had were at like a a regular school. So it wasn't at the, at our magnet school, but it was at the regular school, but I still had it connections. Like I was still in touch with those people, but one of the boys was highly, highly, highly gifted, like really highly gifted. And he was just bored to tears. There was mm-hmm. nothing in high school that yeah. he didn't already know. He couldn't tolerate it. And so he made the case to leave at 16 and just do the GED right then, which he passed with yeah. fine colors and be done. And it was like, it made sense for him. He was going into, I don't remember what he wanted to go into, but it was where he was going to go do an internship. Mm -hmm. It has something to do with computers. And it was like, he didn't have to be 18 to do that. Like it was just, it felt like such a waste for him. And I think that sometimes there are circumstances where it makes sense to have that conversation with your teens and to hear out what their reasoning is and mm-hmm. what their plan is going and sitting home and playing video games for the next two years. Mm, probably no. not for me, but if you're like, no, I can, you know, I can do this program and then I can start at community college and I can have my associates by the time I'm 18. And then I can like, okay, let's try that. You know, I'm down for this idea. Um, 
I think that there is a lot of really cool programs and really cool ideas out there. And when your kid is really driven and they have a passion, um, a girl who babysat our kids, she's really driven to create a um, therapy center with horses, so like equine therapy. Oh, wow. And I'm just like, that's amazing. Yeah. And so she actually, she was watching my kids, I think it was every Thursday. And she's like, I'm not going to be able to do this anymore. And I was like, why? What's going on? And she was taking college classes for that passion. And I was like, that's the greatest news ever. I will yeah, find that's to watch great. This is amazing. Um, so I get really excited when I see kids passionate like that. And I think that a part of that is that feeling of being heard feeling like I have an opinion and I have value and my parents see that and they're able to help me to achieve those goals and to help me believe that I can achieve those goals. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, I, again, my kids are, are still young. Yeah. I don't know where they're going to end, but yeah, I, I am all here to support whatever their dreams, their passion, their, inspiration or path they want to take. I know, love I it. That. Do you plan on continuing any formal education for yourself? Uh, so I really love teaching. So that's another, another thing that I've always known that at some point in my life, I wanted to teach. I love it. Um, so I love that now I'm teaching my children. It's like yeah. so rewarding for me. Um, but I am working because I love, I love my Spanish classes that I do. Mm -hmm. I am working on a project because I want to be a, I know. <laughs> Tell me more. I know, right? Um, I, I actually want to be a, um, how do you say? It's like a storytelling bilingual artists kind of thing it's amazing so like to do events um like libraries and go around and 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 tell stories for kids oh, wow. in spanish and english maybe and so so if you're going to a library on this is a bilingual event do you tell the story like the whole thing in spanish and then the whole thing in english or do you tell part of it in spanish then part of it in english or do you mix it up like I think for my purposes, I'm probably going to mix it up. Mm -hmm. Parts in English, parts in Spanish. Nice. Um, because I'm trying to target, like my target audience would be children that that are from uh, kids from uh, Hispanic communities that, mm -hmm. that the parents want them to learn more Spanish. Oh, okay. But also, also parents of English speaking uh, kids that want their kids to be more exposed to. Spanish. Yeah. And so it would so be a would band be of, of like, we would sing some songs in Spanish. Maybe we sing it in English too. And, uh, I, and we, love so that, I really love Fridays. It's my favorite time because I do have my uh, story time class every Friday morning. I love um, it. And it's just really great to be around young kids and uh yeah. doing and teaching that. them to be yeah. open to languages and approach learning a language in a really fun way i think that that kind of exposure really primes them to adopt language easier mm -hmm. um it's not like so rigid and formal and like intimidating <laughs> it's really yeah. friendly and fun and little kids especially with music that combination seems to go really well for them. And we've always learned through stories. So humans have learned for exactly, a long time. Yeah. So I think that sounds amazing. Yeah, I would like to be a better storytelling person. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Sandy, I'm so <laughs> happy with you. I'm so excited for you. Oh, thank you. You're thank so you. incredible. You have oh. an incredible story. You are just a, so fun to talk to. You're an inspiration. And I think those kiddos are very, very lucky to have you. Yeah. I have great, great uh, models. You know, my mom, my cousins, everybody around me. You, you know, you've helped me so much through so many. You have no idea uh, how much you've helped me. Uh, like I said, I still tell my husband, I'm like, what, do, what would Sammy say? <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Uh, Nora says, thank you, Sandy, for sharing your story and sure parenting for fostering a great conversation. You're so welcome, Nora. And then Ro Rosie, I think, says, mi niña, you are doing really good with your kids and make me so proud of you. Mami, te quiero mucho. You did the best. I love you so much, mama. Is that your mom? Yeah, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. Literally, Amazing. I would not be here because it wasn't for her. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> I love it so much. Wow. You have such a great, like, n little network that you've, that you've fostered. Mm -hmm. And I am... Very grateful that you've been here with us today. I really look forward to having you back. Um, I know we're going to try to get your husband in the hot seat too. Um, <laughs> his side of it. Christina Cumby says you're both amazing. Thanks, Christina. Um, and I'm so glad I can see actual names. I don't know when that started, but it used to just say Facebook commenter. Now I can actually Aww. see names. So yay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. um, it might be from the main page. That might be why. That might be the difference. So mm -hmm. Anyways, I'm so glad that you could all be here with us. Thank you so much, Sandy. And uh, are there any other comments or questions or anything you want to share with us before we go today? Um, you know, no, I, I think uh, I'm good. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, your kids are going to be okay. And you guys are all rocking this mom life. And uh, just keep doing what you're doing. Awesome. I love it. What a great sign off. Thank you so much. And I will see everybody later. Bye. Thank you.